no better way to start to unpack the connection between soil building agriculture practices and human health further than with David and Anne, who have studied over a thousand papers and published a peer review one themselves, looking at the connection between soil health and human health. For everyone who keeps saying that a carrot is a carrot and a calorie is a calorie, the science has proven and continues to prove otherwise. There are massive differences in healthy compounds in our food, both plants and animal protein, connected to the way the food has been grown. Although we don't fully understand the nuances and the connections, we can safely say healthy soil leads to healthy food, leads to healthy gut systems, and that leads to healthy people. What are the connections between healthy farming practices, healthy soil, healthy produce, healthy gut and healthy people? Welcome to a special series where we go deep into the relationship between regenerative agriculture practices that build soil health and the nutritional quality of the food we end up eating. We unpack the current state of science, the role of investments, businesses, nonprofits, entrepreneurs and more. This series is supported by the 18 Foundation, who are looking to make more investments and grants in this space. You can find out more here, 18foundation.org or the link in the show notes below. So welcome to another episode. I'm extremely happy to have David R. Montgomery back on the show and to welcome Anne Bickley for the first time here. They published the book, What Your Food Ate, which I can highly, highly recommend, which I think when this is out, is out almost everywhere. So I can't wait to unpack this nutrient density piece, the connection between healthy soil, um, actually practices to get healthy soil, healthy produce, healthy gut systems, and healthy people, and of course, healthy ecosystems, and to really unpack what we know now, what we don't know yet, and what should you as the audience of, of this podcast know. So thank you so much for coming here and welcome, Anne and David. Yeah, thanks, Cohen. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to be back. It's been a little while. Um, I checked. Back? It was... It was February 2018, uh, so that's more than four years ago, and you were on episode 24. So you were definitely one of the earlier ones uh, back in the day, and, and already then with a book, obviously, Growing a Revolution, that, that many, many people have read uh, in this space because it gave such a, it's a good overview. But So to start with, I think we already talked about nutrient density then, but what triggered you both, first of all, to work on a book together again, because you've done that in the past, then you wrote one, uh, or actually two by, by yourself, David, to, to join forces again and to write this monumental book, because it's been a lot of years, but it's it's actually, it's really a, a monumental book in the space, I think. Oh, well, thank you. Um, you know, well, you know, we survived writing The Hidden Half of Nature together, so we knew we could do it. <laughs> um, and it's, a, you know, one of the big things that was sort of kicking around both our minds after writing the previous books was, what really is the effect of farming practices on what gets into the food that then sets up elements of human health? And, you know, that's a subject that is, you know, really transcends either one of our disciplines. I'm a geologist and a biologist, and it made a lot of sense to work together on it for, in terms of being having two minds to interpret and understand and integrate and synthesize all the material that it takes to think about how we treat the soil cascading up through plants and animals and their health into our health. Um, and it worked. It's a way better book than I think either one of us would have written on our own. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that that's true. And and I guess the other thing, you know, maybe at a higher level, Cohen, is that um, agriculture has always been about um, food and about feeding humanity. And I think a lot of us take for granted or think, oh, that food, of course it's, of course it's nutritious. It's, it's food, that carrot, you know, that cauliflower, that lettuce, you know, whatever, whatever food it is you're eating. And yet the more that David and I have done research in this area, it's pretty clear. Two things are pretty clear. Um, farming practices can change the quality of the soil. And the quality of the soil has a big influence on the quality of the food. And so when you sort of look at those separate pieces and then you put them together, it was in many ways kind of natural that, that you know, we would end up here at this book. Not, you know, not at the beginning of what we call the Dirt Trilogy. So that's Dirt, the Hidden Half and Growing a Revolution. But, but here at the end, when you put all of it together, it's a kind of inescapable 
question uh, for me, at least, at, in terms of what um, what agriculture is supposed to do for humanity, and then asking the question: Is it doing that? It's certainly, for the most part, in most places of the world, at you know, at this point in human culture, it's feeding us. But is it really nourishing us? That's the question. I think it's a fascinating piece to to unpack further. Is uh, why did it? I wouldn't say even because in your book you actually show that that a lot of this research or a lot of this um, the connection between those pieces of soil health and, and human health um, has been going on for quite a while. Like why did it take so long, or does it take so long? Because I wouldn't I wouldn't even imagine it's so known outside our bubble or it's so talked about outside our bubble. But it seems such a logical connection. What you do to the soil ends up uh, affecting what is in that carrot and ends up affecting you. Do you have any? explanation why we don't talk about it way more and why we quote unquote had to wait for you to write this book or why is that not a constant discussion when we talk about food agriculture practices and and, and basically yeah the, the state of healthcare etc why, why are we talking about like a carrot is not a carrot what, what is what is what are we why is that such a big blind spot if you have any clue well you know we asked ourselves that question many times while writing this book because when you go back and look at um, some of the early insights of some of the pioneers of organic agriculture in particular, some you know, people like Sir Albert Howard and Lady Eve Balfour, they were onto these connections. Um, and they, they, they were onto them uh, empirically. They had observed that livestock fed on uh, um, uh, plants that were grown in healthier soils, you know, had better health themselves. But what, one of the things that I think really uh, hindered taking up the argument in scientific circles was the lack of an understanding of the mechanisms involved. And if there's one thing scientists are really, really good at is criticizing things that don't have a solid explanation behind them. You know, it's sort of how it works, not just that something happens, but well, how does it work? And, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, when a lot of the early research and literature that we, we cite and talk about and tell stories about in the book was done, the whole idea that microbial communities in the soil were partners for plants was was really not known, let alone how it actually worked. And, you know, in the subsequent 80 years or so, uh, an awful lot's been learned about those connections and how they work and the, the role of symbiotic relationships between soil bacteria and fungi around the roots of plants and how that uh, affects the, and supports the health of plants and crops. Um, and so that's sort of one effect is that we, you know, science wasn't really ready with explanations when some of these connections were first posited and kicked around. And so they weren't given much credence. Um, and secondly, you know, one of the things we really had to do in writing this book was dive into a whole bunch of different fields, soil science, agronomy, animal husbandry, uh, human health, and both chronic and um, um, infectious diseases. There's a lot of disciplines that you need to connect, that you need to think about in connecting the dots between soil health and human health. And science has traditionally been divided into, you know, we each specialize in our own discipline and, and tend not to look beyond that. And so, you know, this book is really an effort in um, synthesizing what's known in many different disciplines around this core issue. Um, and there's really not much of a reward system, frankly, in science for doing synthesis. You know, we're, we're, we're trained to divide things into small chunks, bite-sized pieces of science that we can hand off to a grad student and get done in the course of a thesis. Um, so there's a whole bunch of issues I could ramble on on as a professor, but Anne may have her own perspectives on this too. <laughs> well, your, your question, it, I mean, it is a really good one, Cohen. Why, why don't more people talk about this? Uh, I think it's a good question because you look at... Um, you look at the health of of humanity sort of you know across the globe and there's you know different afflictions in different places but it's it's for sure that it seems with you know affluence and wealth and um you know so-called developed countries money and all of that you know development and what makes us modern it doesn't seem to make us any healthier we may be, longe longevity may be increasing, but you have to ask, well, what is the quality of that life in the last 10 to 15 years, or maybe, you know, 20 to 30 years? Is that, is that good? Is that, 
is that how a person would want um, to live out their last years? And so to me, there's, you know, we all know that diet affects our health. And so if you think it, it's not at all a leap for me to think, okay, we, we know that diet has a profound influence on health. So what is it about the way we grow our food that might be affecting it and, and you know, and therefore our health? And I, so I think also just the sheer amount of food that, that we grow um, is dazzling. And it's, and so we, we think it's maybe not, um, things are taken care of. We're equating all of that abundance and yield with quality and with nutrient density. And that, of course, we know isn't always the case. And I also think, you know, why we don't talk about this is that just fewer and fewer of us even grow food or raise animals. And so we're disconnected from what a healthy plant or a healthy animal looks like. And I think for any farmer out there, they know when their animals are sick or they know when their animals are healthy. And, and that, that can be said too for farmers who just grow crops. So I think when you see it and when you do that kind of work, it's not lost on farmers that their practices are having effects, both positive and negative um, on, uh, on the plant and animal foods that become a part of the human diet. You know, and I think there's one other element too, and that, that gets at, at your original question in terms of uh, how we think about um, the way that science can demonstrate things. And it sort of boils down to, if you have a very complex set of systems, like uh, the soil, animals, and the human body, and you're talking about the connections between each of those really horribly complex it systems. It gets very, and, very complex, yeah. <laughs> and you're talking about the health of those systems, which itself is very complex, because, you know, thinking in terms of people, we've got what our genes, whether or not we get any exercise, what we eat, and we're at, we're trying to argue how we raise what we eat as well. Um, you know, it's the the ability to design simple tests to demonstrate with high certainty what the connections are from one end of that long causal chain to the very end, other end of that chain from the soil to people's health is quite difficult um and that's where you get into the difference between what i like to call sort of scientific common sense and scientific certainty where if you can what the approach we took in writing this book was to try and take all the little linkages between how farming practices affects the health of the soil how the health of the soil affects the health of crops how the health of crops affects the health of animals and how the health of crops and animals given what gets into them into our diet affects our health and if you break into those little bits you can put the science together like beads on a string which will lead basically you what you did is without taking the full chain maybe we we will never have the the scientific knowledge to to do that full um, the full chain basically, but if you cut it into pieces, which you just mentioned, there is a lot actually there already very well uh, written in papers. I think you read over a thousand papers. I'm not saying all of them are, are were good, but a lot of these things linkages have been shown. It's just that they are very different in very different places or very different even like uh, legs of uh, the scientific community, and and it just they were never put together or not in this way. Plus you mentioned at the beginning that probably we we came a long way in the last years, in the last decades, especially the last years as well, to understand many of these things, or at least to start to to grasp how these linkages worked. And so just for anybody out there, like it's not that the, a lot of this research wasn't done. It was just done on very specific pieces of the chain and, and proving certain things. Like what, for example, what, what was a, a big surprise that you saw in, in these thousand papers that you read where you thought, wow, actually somebody did that maybe recently or far way back to show a certain piece of the chain that we we maybe didn't even know that somebody did the research of. Well, you know, um, one of those pieces that was a real surprise to me, it's a real kind of an aha that helped, you know, sort of cement the chain of causality that runs through this whole uh, uh, connection was um, when we were looking at the effects of what some of the kinds of things that farming practices affect in our food, uh, mineral micronutrients, um, phytochemicals, uh, and antioxidants and anti-inflammatories, um, and certain amino acids in our food, all of which are sound science showing how farming practices can affect them. One of the real interesting ahas was uh, studies that showed that uh, the kinds of flavors in, in foods that people really like and enjoy 
are rooted in those compounds that have been shown to have, you know, fairly positive effects in terms of human health promotion. Um, so the idea that our bodies are hardwired when we're dealing with, with, with whole natural foods, foods that haven't been, you know, broken into yeah, pieces. Even after all those years of processed food, too much, yes. very interesting salt and, and, and fats, we, we still are able to, to distinguish quality from non-quality. Yeah, it, when, when they're not sort of masked by those yeah. lovely salt, fat, and sugar combinations <laughs> that we're all so enamored with, be, you know, which is also rooted in our biology. But the idea that our, our bodies have the ability in terms of sorting through natural foods to sort of be attracted to those that have a better nutrient density um, was a real eye-opener for me. It makes perfect evolutionary sense. I think Anne wasn't as surprised because as the biologist, she was like, well, of course. <laughs> um, but, but also I think uh, in livestock it has been shown, like Fred Provence and others have shown that livestock is very able to self-medicate and pick what they need, even though we don't, might not understand what it exactly does. So we gave more credit to, to livestock than we gave to ourselves, basically. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah. And, and I guess at that con, you know, not all of us, you know, give livestock that, you know, that kind of credit, because, of course, there's different ways of raising livestock and feeding them the things that we think they ought to be eating, as opposed to, you know, turning them out to a pasture and letting their body wisdom uh, function and operate normally and like it's supposed to in terms of choosing combinations of different plants that different times of the day. And um, yeah, I, I, I do have to say that I gained a whole new appreciation for how ruminants. So, you know, for those out there may not know what a ruminant is, of course, that's, that's a cow, a sheep or a goat. And they're, they have this wonderful part of their digestive tract called the rumen. And that's where most of their microbiome lives and their microbiome, um, has a huge effect on um, on their health and their well-being in terms of what the animals are eating. And the microbiome really, really thrives on fiber-rich living plants. If you're a ruminant, that is the that's the diet to eat. So um, that and and so that that flavor feedback thing that Dave was just talking about it happens in in every organism, um, really. I mean, even panda bears, right? They just all day long, they're sitting there eating bamboo, but there's something right about about panda biology and bamboo that, you know, we don't have to train pandas to go eat something else. They know from the get-go that, you know, bamboo, that's what I eat day in, day out. Yeah. That's what I thrive on, yeah. And, and so I also remember from the book, that we have, I don't know if we are there yet in terms of, let's say, general public, but we we have to look really beyond the standard, um, the standard calories counting or the standard calories we look at in, in food, but also the standard vitamins we search for, because there's a whole world beyond that of things we need very, very small amounts of, but they are absolutely essential for how our brain functions, how our bodies functions, etc. So that world beyond the standard few things that we currently follow um, and that have been proven in science, like vitamin C does this and that, et cetera, et cetera. Like, how did that research, how, how far do you think that research is or how ready are we to accept that there is a whole world of dark matter, let's say, beyond the few things that we currently look for in food yeah. and in medicine and in pills, obviously, because that's what yeah. we unfortunately I, do. You know, I think we're really early in that research, Cohen, because for so long, nutritional research and you know, dietary pundits have just mostly been focused on fats, carbohydrates, and protein as like, that's what we all need to think about in our food. And it's only been more recently that phytochemicals, so these are, you know, phytochemicals are uh, compounds and molecules that are naturally occurring in plants. Plants make them, uh, not for our benefit, but for theirs, but many of the benefits that plants reap from phytochemicals serve um, also functions and purposes in our body, everything from um, normalizing cell function to helping our cells and tissues sort of operate the human janitorial services that need to happen 24 hours a day so that we can all, you know, feel normal and keep functioning. And you use the term dark matter, and it reminds me, one of the papers sort of refers to this, you know, the dark matter of nutrition. And we don't 
we don't know all the compounds and molecules that are in, especially um, the plant plant foods. You know, there are tens of thousands of phytochemicals, you know, across the entire botanical world. And, and even though we don't eat across, you know, the entire botanical world, our crops, fruits and vegetables, grains, the whole, anything from a plant contains a fair number of phytochemicals. And we don't, we don't know everything that they do in us. And then, of course, in the book, one of the other areas that I thought was really, really interesting is that there's even um, compounds that soil microorganisms make, bacteria and fungi make, that plants take up. And there's, um, there's a, a, a person out of uh, Penn State who is doing, had, has written a number of papers on this. This compound is called ergothionine. It, chemically, it happens to be an amino acid. Biologically, it does a lot of very interesting um, things, beneficial things. And um, this guy um, always makes a point of, of asking this question, you know, if ergothionine, you know, weren't doing something for us, you know, why are there um, receptors on every cell in the human body for it? You know, so this is just a, when you get that kind of correspondence, it means, mm-hmm, this, this compound is This doing, is important. Yeah. yeah, this is important and we should pay attention to it. And if fungi and bacteria are making this, it immediately makes me ask, well, then what are we doing to levels of ergothionine in the human diet if tillage in particular, you know, is chopping up fungi and then, you know, over application of fertilizer and various other things, if that's knocking back microbial populations, it's likely knocking back levels of this compound um, in foods of the human diet too. And, and imagine how many others are out there like that, that we don't even know about, like how, yeah. how much, like, I have the feeling that in this, this kind of research, the more research you do, the more you discover you don't know. And, and like the, the percentage you think, okay, maybe 10 years ago, we thought we knew 5%. And currently we, we, we imagine maybe one or even less because it just, it seems to be exponentially growing uh, the amount of, of um, items almost out there that we, we need and, and what it means for diversity as well in terms of diet, which obviously is a, is a big part of, uh, of, I wouldn't say your diet advice, but a big part of it. Like, diversity, because we don't know all the things, the more diverse, the better in, in many cases. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that sort of points to, you know, this being sort of a real exciting area of science, you know, not only to be by integrating different disciplines, but areas where you get, you know, when you start answering, asking and answering some of the broad questions, it brings up more and bigger questions, and then you just keep finding more and more to dig into. It makes for a pretty exciting area. Um, but the, you know, we, I think we can point to certain areas where we can pretty confidently say that farming practices are affecting the kinds of compounds that on average have net beneficial effects for people. And or the other way the, around. We know that they they harm it, like the plowing, like there's a whole chapter obviously on chemical inputs. Like we know, yeah, we may, we don't know the full extent of the damage, but we know it's damaging. Yeah, and, it, and it's reversible. It goes both ways, right? It's sort of how we treat the soil can either uh, promote the beneficial compounds or, as has happened in conventional agriculture for the last century, it, as you're saying, uh, can uh, compromise or reduce them. And, you know, there's a few things that have sort of hindered recognition of that. And one of them really is sort of what we think of as what is a nutrient. Um, and so we're talking about nutrient density, you know, the density of what? What kind of things are we talking about? And the whole world of phytochemicals that's been sort of opened up in terms of the connections for human health is one that only recently have, has the nutrition community been starting to talk about them as, you know, as phytonutrients or, you know, some other kind of nutrient than what the, the discipline has focused on. Um, and the difference there is really, as, as far as Ann and I can parse it, um, seems to be that we've been mostly focused uh, for a long time in nutrition and looking at the kinds of compounds that are essential for life. You know, and that makes sense. It's the first kind of things to think about because without them, you you know, if, you, if you're not living, you you're die. not very yeah. Yeah. Um, But there's all these other compounds that we're just starting to learn much about their effects uh, on uh, th that are beneficial to health. And so if we sort of expand the definition to things that are healthful as opposed to nutritious, 
you know, in the old version of nutrition, nutrition, shall we say, um, it opens this whole new world of possibilities in terms of looking at how farming practices affect what's in our food for better or for worse. And that's, that's sort of a big area of where we ended up on in the book, because those um, where there's solid evidence for farming practices greatly affecting the uh, what's in our food sort of maps into many of those health promoting compounds uh, and conventional practices don't really stack up very well when measured against that metric. And so what made you decide to, and I will definitely link the paper below as well, to run your own study? I mean, after reading so many, was there a missing piece? Was there something that was itching? Like we, we want to run our own study connecting soil well, health to, yeah. to, let's say, nutrient density, um, which I think is one of the first times that ever has been done. Um, but what, what makes you decide, okay, we, we have solid evidence of all the different linkages, but we want to, yeah, we want to do a bigger, a bigger chain and, and show. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're both really curious people. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, um, we wanted to find out for ourselves, like, w you know, is this stuff really connected? And, you know, we're not like a giant research group and, and our sample size was small, but, one thing that was sort of lacking in the literature is is a specific assessment of soil health alongside a specific assessment of a crop on two neighboring farms. So what we're what we're doing here is we're getting the same crop, the same soil, and yet different practices. And this is so, the so not the same soil, basically, yeah. Well, the same soil types of way a soil scientist would look the at them. type, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. Could look at them and go, yeah, not the same soil. You know, one dark brown and the other khaki. Well, kind of and idea. that and that point actually is, you know, part of the problem because soil scientists tend to look at physical characteristics and chemical characteristics of soil, and less so on the biology. So when I say same soil type, it would be as if you had a soil map and you're looking at Cardington clay, you know, for example, in on both farms. So we we looked at 10 farms from California to Connecticut, 10, uh, pairs. 10 pairs of farms. So, so 20, 20 farms. farms yeah. And um, these farms, we uh, looked at a uh, couple of vegetable farms and then uh, some farmers in the Midwest. So that was uh, corn and soy looked at um, also it was sorghum and peas. And, and um, what we found was, you know, pretty interesting on, on average um, phytochemicals and micronutrients. So micronutrients are particular minerals and vitamins. They were higher in all of the regeneratively grown crops and um soil health was also higher how did you define regeneratively i think you you took a moment of time like you say farms that have been building soil health for at least 10 15 years or something like that because of course there's no there's no definition yet or not let's say yeah. a, an agreed upon one so how did you how did you pick those so um we relied a lot on the network of farmers that we met and got associated with in writing growing a revolution so that was sort of our, our door opener to meeting some of them. And then they knew people who had also been doing stuff uh, along these lines. And so what we what we sort of defined or used as our regenerative farms are farms that had been following the principles of conservation agriculture for at least five for between five and 10 years. And, and what those principles are would be uh, they were no till. They uh, planted cover crops. So they always kept the ground covered and they grow a divert. They grew a diversity of crops, at least five or six crops in a rotation or if they um, uh, or a very diverse mix of cover crops. Um, and we you know, selected those that had been doing the all three of those for at least five or 10 years. Some of them had been no till for longer. Um, and that was basically really our. Um, our point of, of distinction between the conventional and the regenerative farms. Two of the farms were small scale, um, uh, no-till vegetable farms that were effectively organic, though, as I recall, not certified, um, but that used no, no agrochemicals. Um, some of the other larger regenerative farms also were effectively organic, but we didn't use the organic conventional distinction. We wanted uh, to look at these soil health building practices and so we measured uh, soil organic matter and soil health to try and see whether the regenerative farms, you know, actually had healthier soil than their neighboring conventional farms. And that did pencil out. 
And then, as Anne was That's saying, nice. there, yeah. <laughs> there were differences in the yeah. So it seems to work on the soil at least. Yeah. Uh, and the on average, the, there were differences in um, what was coming off the crops as well. And most strikingly and consistently across the board were differences in the phytochemical levels. And 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 you were saying on average there were uh, these were higher, but average is always a tricky one because it hides a lot. What was your biggest surprise, or what was the biggest maybe also disappointment, or what what was the the, the most striking difference you you discovered or uncovered? Yeah, I, I guess in particular there was with um, the California no-till vegetable farm the compare the farm that we compared that to. It was vitamin K that really struck me. Cabbage was the crop that we um, looked at there. And the vitamin K levels in the regenerative cabbage were something like, I don't have it in it front like of me. Yeah, it was like 30, 34% higher wow. than in the, um, you know, I just would call it the, the non-regenerative farm to which it was compared. So that... You know, Which I think that, was even organic, if I remember correctly. The 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 pairing there was regenerative yeah. versus organic, even. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. So, so that's a lot. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and and vitamin K is a interesting. Um, it's an interesting vitamin in that it does. It, it's involved with a lot of different things in our bodies and people. It's not one of the, you know, sort of normal vitamins like a B vitamin or a C vitamin. <laughs> it's even vitamin. a family, right? It's K1, 2, et cetera, yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, anyway, that was that was one thing that really stuck out. It was just because I think, I don't think we had any other single difference that was that high that was like 30% greater. Most were, you know, high teens or no, something like that. There were some that were several fold. There, there, there was, it was, there was a, one of the things that was, there was a lot of variability in it, uh, yeah. particularly in the minerals. And, and you might expect that because um, uh, th there's a lot of variability there and it's shown in previous studies as well. But the, the thing that really struck out to me was how consistently the phytochemicals across the board were higher in the regenerative, on the regenerative farms. And was something lower? Like, was there some disappointment, let's say, from from the, the whole regenerative movement piece or something that didn't come out that you may expect it? Yeah, there, there were a couple of vitamins, if I recall. I'm not recalling off the top of my head. I could probably look it up here pretty easily. Um, where they were, um, where the regenerative ones came out on average a little lower. Yeah, there was one, I think there was, um, I, it was either magnesium or manganese. That was another thing that in one of the, one of the paired farms um oh yeah it was it was vitamin b6 and manganese yeah vitamin b6 and manganese were lower in um how many oh this uh, the, yeah the one got here is on average yeah all. so so that was interesting why why those two we don't know <laughs> there's more research is is needed in that yeah. piece and well the the other you know the other surprising thing that uh, you know in writing this book that we realized was that all this variability can be confounding. It can be um, perplexing and you want to know why, why is there all this variability? And there's, there's probably the usual reasons, you know, there may be slight differences in the soil. You've got farmers practices, you've got crops, you know, crops are known to take up different micronutrients and different levels, you know, take Brazil nuts, for example, they are just happen to be rich in selenium. So there's all that sort of variability that's, that's operating, but sort of the variability with the capital V, the big variability out there is, is actually something that we want in our crops and in our animals, because when their microbiome or their genome varies it gives biologically at least this is what evolution is all about without variation there's no resiliency there's no adaptation there's no ability to respond to what um to what nature throws at plants and animals so we actually want variability in our crops and our animals because otherwise everything's just a big monoculture and you know the one pest or the one environmental stressor that comes through wipes everything out. So, 
you know, I, we were, I forget recently who we were talking with, but somebody asked me, they were asking me about their crops and I'm not a farmer, but, um, she said, you, you know, I don't understand this. I had one plant. Um, it was some kind of a leafy green. And she said, she was telling me about it. She said, it, this thing was just like, you know, like I had given it steroids, but you know, I actually had not, but it was just growing gangbusters. And right next to it is this sickly little plant, you know, one third the size. And it was all the same seed. These plants are growing right next to one another. And, um, and it, it just made me think about this whole thing on variability and that we, you really do want that because these plants and animals and biology will sort of figure out how to deploy, you know, that variability to respond to um, what's out there in the environment. And, and this is in a sense, this is what um, regional land, land races and plant, this is how, this is how plant breeding used to occur is you would see, you know, who dies and who lives and you would collect seed from, you know, your best plant. The one that made it, yeah. Right, or if you're a livestock person, then you're looking to see which animals are healthiest and which ones live the longest and which ones yield, you know, if you're a dairy or which ones are yielding, you know, the highest milk for the highest milk quantity for the longest length of time. So all this variability, though, it's confounding and perplexing and it, it, um, is hard to replicate when you're dealing with such a complex variable system. It's there for a very good reason, and and we really should embrace it. And, and so, how did your diet change, if it did at all, uh, during? I mean, of course, we had the lockdowns and and COVID as well. But um, how did that did that change at all while writing this book? Well, yeah, I mean, I we we became much more. We, we were already after writing these kinds of books, Cohen, like, of course, yeah. thinking, I'm like, kind of like, okay, we're reading, you know, we're reading labels, we're eating fresh, we're growing, you know, we're growing some too. But I think what really um, impressed upon me was how important, um, how important the diet of an animal is because of how it affects the fat profile in meat and dairy. And, um, I remember I called up this yogurt maker. <laughs> They're out of, um, I, I called them up because, you know, on their label, it didn't exactly say organic and it has a word like natural on it. And I happen to really like this yogurt because it's quite tangy. It's just got a really great flavor. And so I called them up because I wanted to know what, you were hoping. Are, yeah. <laughs> what are you feeding your animals? Because I'd like to eat your yogurt, but I, I don't want to eat grain. You know, no. I don't want yogurt made from milk of grain fed animals because I'm not looking for a lot, bunch of omega-6 fats in my diet. I can get that out of seed oils. And they told me it was really interesting. They said, well, it depends on the time of year, but basically the animals are, are, um, not out on pasture until, you know, late winter or early spring. So now I time, I time it when I buy that kind of yogurt to be like May, June, cause I'm figuring, okay, animals are all, you know, out on pasture. I'm, I'm getting good stuff. So th that, that I got probably more down into the weeds on it than Dave did. Yeah. Well, the, the, st <laughs> the story behind that is that we basically realized in going through the literature on, to an animal husbandry and meat and dairy production that what an, what a ruminant eats in terms of the nature of the fats in their diet translates over into what we get in meat, in meat and milk and that it matters not only for the health of the animal but also for our health for and for a simple reason uh, you know omega-3 fats tend to be the fats that help to terminate inflammation whereas omega-6 fats are instrumental in initiating inflammation and the, the, the paleo human diet, you know, in, not in the sense of the paleo diet, but just like what people used to eat long time ago, kind of paleo, um, there was a rough balance of omega sixes and omega threes. Um, More or less and, one to one, right? Yeah. yeah and we're yeah, out of 12, one 12 to one. one or something now. Exactly. It's higher than 10 to one now, more omega sixes and omega threes. So we're swamped in omega sixes. And the reason for that's fairly simple. Seeds are rich in omega-6s. Why? Because they're stable fat. They're designed for storage, whereas omega-3s are highly reactive and they're designed for photosynthesis or they play roles in photosynthesis. So leafy green plants have lots of omega-3s and seeds have lots of omega-6s. 
So when we feed cows, we, you know, corn and soybeans and or wheat or any kind of a seed, we're loading them up with omega sixes, and seed oils are rich in omega sixes. Whereas grass-fed um, animals, grass-fed ruminants, have much have a much higher omega three content in their fats, and it turns out that translates over into meat and dairy. And so the human diet has changed greatly because of how we changed our livestock diet. And there's not enough. There's not a lot of recognition of that. That I was completely oblivious to that before we started in the research for this book. And it did change the way we eat because now we're much more conscious about you know trying to go for grass-fed meat and dairy when when possible. Yeah. And and I mean even this this term that we all use grass-fed. Yeah. That's that's not actually totally we we don't really want that's not right. I and of course I'm not in charge of things, but I think this whole sort of product area it should really be you know, um, living plant fed. Of course, that doesn't roll off your tongue like grass fed. Because otherwise it becomes hay or it becomes stored and it dies. You show very nicely in terms of research here yeah, what it means if you cut the grass, bring it in, store it, and then feed it to you, to ruminants compared to the ruminant eating the grass, let's say, fresh. Yeah. It's a very different thing. It's a different thing. Now, on the sort of on the scale of, you know, very different things, there's obviously, you know, not everybody, you know, not all cows live in climates and regions where they can be eating living plants year round. And so <laughs> cutting, cutting the plants, bringing them in and, and letting them go through the silage process is the next best thing. And, and what's interesting is when cows have been in barns all winter and they're eating the, 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 the dead plants, you you look at um, video clips and stuff of cows getting out to a pasture of living plants first thing in the spring, and they are they are beyond happy. You know, yeah, you've uh, never seen a cow move as fast <laughs> as, as that, basically. As yeah, that. no, it's it's so fascinating running, to see. Um, Definitely go go and check YouTube. And and actually, if you want to know more about the omega three and six ratio and the research there, there's been actually quite a lot in France. We've had Pierre Vieux of Bleu Blanqueur on. Um, that that has been labeling that basically as one of the outcome. The best outcome is to, if, for healthy in this case animal protein, is to look at omega three and sixes, and and see because you know what the animal has eaten because of that. And of course, then there's a level of of healthy pasture, etc. But you at least know um, uh, what what kind of feed the animal has had. And there's a lot of research there actually that suggests that omega six and three uh, are driving a lot of our are very good indicators. Let's say of uh, Thing. So there you have changed and you don't really tackle it in the book. I don't think it's the book to do that, but has your um, point on, let's say, animal agriculture, we talk a lot about it in the podcast. There obviously the camp that says uh, we cannot regenerate anything without animals. There's the camp that we, we should all go vegan. Um, mm -hmm. Has your stand changed on that at all? Has it become less radical, more radical, different? Because of course, one of the, the, the principles you mentioned, I think, in Growing the Revolution is the integration of animals, David. So has, has your view changed on the animal part of our diet or the animal part of our agriculture system? Yeah, well, there's sort of there's sort of two threads there. One is, you know, is animal ag integration necessary for regenerative agriculture? And, you know, I tend to argue that it's not necessary, but it can accelerate soil rebuilding if done properly. So it can be it can be an essential component of a well run regenerative farm. But I've been on regenerative farms that have no animals on them or no no um, no livestock on them. <laughs> um, and, and they've rebuilt their soil very well. And, and those places have essentially microbial livestock. You know, there, there's organisms that are doing many of the same roles as as and our, or getting manure from somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or the ones I've been were not. Um, but yeah. you could do that. Um, yeah. But I've also been on farms where it seems that the in you know, well integrated animal agriculture has greatly accelerated soil building and helped the process along. So I'm in the camp that it sort of looks at, well, you know, animal agriculture is not necessary for regenerative, but it may actually be a really good thing for most regenerative farms if done properly. Um, and in terms of my sort of view of animal agriculture at a, at a broad scale, um, I've come around to sort of thinking that the, you know, there are environments in the world uh, where grazing is really probably the best land use in terms of environmental considerations if it's done right 
Um, and that and regenerative grazing practices, uh, intensive rotational grazing and, and variants on it are things where in the right environment can actually work really well. And ruminants have this wonderful ability to turn grass into meat and milk. Um, where if you look at some areas where um, there's a lot of uh, um, monocropping today, say in the western part of the plains in America, uh, um, water's in great supply. We're basically mining groundwater to raise corn to feed the cattle, when instead we could actually raise, you know, the cattle on the open range and let them and restore the prairie. There's so my and the aquifer probably, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's a good examples of places where you can build soil organic matter with well done grazing. Some of those studies are still sort of controversial, but the I've seen evidence that is, I've, I've heard people continuing like the I think George Monbiot now has his new book out called Genesis or Regenesis and continues right. to ignore that that whole body of science it calls it that it doesn't exist basically. So it's it's very persistent, um, but yeah. yeah, at the same time, research after research and like like on on the land if you talk to the right farmers you see i mean it's it's out there it's not that you yeah. you can deny it yep and there and there are good peer-reviewed studies that have you know dealt with elements of that and there is i think an element of you know sort of willful ignorance uh in some circles where that have a you know a a a, a more militant dietary perspective to try and push uh, and I think my perspective, and, and perhaps Anne's as well, is sort of more moderate in the middle of sort of thinking about where does it make sense to actually raise animals as part of agriculture? And we should pay more attention to how we do it, because I think that that's really the big problem with animal agriculture today it isn't so much that, you know, people are eating meat and dairy. Um, it's how we are raising the animals that provide our meat and dairy. We're doing it in ways that are environmentally destructive and that are not beneficial to our own nutrition and that don't respect the health um, of, of the animals involved. That's all wrong, but there's different ways to actually do it that I think would have a better environmental footprint, could help with human nutrition, and could give you know cows like the ones Anne was talking about sort of dancing out into the spring pasture um, you know, a higher quality of life as well. So yeah. it's it's sort of a conditional assessment on my view. I think I, it's interesting to me. I think part of the reason for, you know, this this whole movement away from animals and animal products in the human diet is in part because, you know, mainstream animal agriculture is is really pretty awful. And so a lot of people want to have, I don't want to have anything to do with that either. It's like <laughs> I'm not eating that kind of um, meat nor consuming those kind of dairy products, but that doesn't mean that I'm, you know, tossing aside animals out of, out of my diet. I mean, it, I, I think being an omnivore is one of the like biggest privileges <laughs> of, of being a human being the, not being a pun that it has to eat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you imagine B bamboo day in day out? I mean, we're we're omnivores, and when you when you think about that in the context too of our, you know, just the genomic diversity across the human population, this is this is a this is in part what has made us such a successful species. We can eat just about anything. We can live just about anywhere. It's also, you know created problems for sure. But um, I just don't see any need to uh, toss out animal foods from the entirety of the human diet. And the, the other thing that I think a lot of, you know, hardcore vegans and, and others in the plant-based camp, and especially those in, in say North America or Europe or Australia, maybe what they don't realize is that most of um there's an awful big slice of uh farmers in other parts of the world whose livelihood is absolutely dependent on animals and it's not like a 500 you know head herd of cattle or something like that it's one goat or it's one cow and these animals are essential to the you know, the livelihoods of 
of many different kinds of populations. And if we want to do away with all animal agriculture on the planet, well, we're also killing human cultures along with that, you know, if that's if that's the direction that some are headed. It's not, it doesn't reflect the long, long ties and relationships that people have had with um, with animals um, that have become part of our agricultural systems. Which, of course, is something that could change or doesn't have to change everywhere. But there, it, it, is, it is an important point. But at the same time, societies change. I mean, we, we right. once thought slavery was normal and, and, and many other things, So, which, of course, vegans always point out to that. But what then do you think about, maybe this is opening a whole a different Pandora box, but uh, box of Pandora, but what do you think of these um, ways of, let's say, the precision fermentation to make dairy in large uh, stainless steel vats? Like, has there been research? Because I always ask the question immediately, okay, let's look at the nutrients. And they always say, just the same with hydroponics, et cetera, it's the same. I would say, yeah, if you say that, you probably haven't looked at nutrient research for a long time or ever. So it, it sort of disqualifies you, I think, immediately. But what? because there are a lot of now dairy alternatives that actually have been made with uh, certain cells and certain fermentation that, that at least up, like on the surface seem like dairy. What, what do you think there of that whole move towards um, brewing dairy or brewing meat as well? Um, you know, is that interesting to you? Is it not interesting? Are you following it? What, what's the what's your take on that? Because it seems to be exploding at the moment, at least yeah. in, in terms of attention. Yeah, the other thing that our species likes a lot is novel shiny yet. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, shiny stuff, new stuff. We are we are like programmed for novelty, and so you get these, you know, wow, meat and meat and dairy, and just the whole use of those terms with these non-meat, non-dairy things is interesting. So when you ask the question, is it interesting? Yeah, I think it's really interesting, but maybe not for the reasons that that, that others do. Um, I, and then on this point of, you know, are they the same nutritionally? Just yesterday, um, a paper came through my email and some researchers had done a model where they had made a plant-based kind of protein thing using many of the ingredients that are in a lot of, you know, mainstream plant-based things. And then they used real meat protein and, um, they found that the absorption of protein was different. Um, and I forget exactly what organism they, I think it was a cell culture of some, of some sort, but they found that the protein in the fake meat was not at all absorbed in the same way as that. Which is logical because it's not the same. Huh. Right. Which it's makes not, sense. It's not the same. And so, uh, and I don't know that anybody has truly looked at what our cells and tissues, you know, at that sort of cellular level, what does our body think? There's what our brain thinks about it. And there's what our, you know, gut thinks about it. But, you know, what, um, what does it really mean for human health? Of course, nobody's going to do randomized controlled trials on eating fake meat and dairy. So, 20 years, yeah. Right. So that stuff's all sitting on the grocery shelves and everybody's buying it. And what's interesting to me is that some of these same folks who are in favor of these, you know, fake meat and dairy are also, well, you know, and I don't like additives or preservatives in my food. And I certainly don't like, you know, eating a lot of plastic. Well, where do they think all that stuff is coming from? It's coming out of, it's being extruded out of, you know, plastic equipment inside of factories. And it, and it's having flavor enhancers and additives added to it. Otherwise, otherwise nobody would eat this stuff. You know, that's like uh -huh. one of the points we made in the book, like a pile of ground up stuff that's had phytochemicals and minerals and all kinds of things stripped out of it. And then you've got to put it back together. And you have to add the flavor. So, you know, the whole thing, that's what I, when you say interesting, yeah, I think it's really interesting. <laughs> so what would you tell, like, let's say we're in a theater and I know you just, I think you just launched the book in Seattle, actually in person. So that must have been amazing. Let's say we're in a theater and the room is full of, of uh, quote unquote, smart impact investors or smart investors looking for, they have read the books, they've um, understood the importance of soil health. What would you like them to walk away with? Uh, of course, without giving investment advice, but where would you like to point them to look, look, this this is a direction to start digging deeper. Or these are connections that are um, ready for, I wouldn't say investments, but ready for more attention and more resources and more 
um, yeah, more energy, let's say. What would you like to that they walk away with uh, that evening and then start doing tomorrow morning? Well, one thing that I think you can point to uh, sort of at the high level is in one of the big conclusions of the book is that, you know, what's good for the land is good for us, too. And so that as we look at investment opportunities in the agricultural sector, doing better by the land should add value to what comes off the land in terms of its connection to human health. Now, how that gets branded, how that gets measured, it's highly variable. But in general, it's pointing in that direction, that if you're involved in the agricultural sector, you need to sort of worry about, well, how are you treating your land if you're concerned about the quality of what's coming off the fields or, or out of the, the barn? Um, that would be sort of the, the, the first thing I would offer. And the second piece is that as more and more of this, these kind of connections and relationships become clear to more people, I could anticipate growing consumer demand for foods that were grown in those ways. So if you're thinking about you know, that sector and getting ahead of things, there's those connections. But the other connection, too, is that um, these regenerative practices can actually rebuild the fertility of the land. So there's probably opportunities in terms of turning around degraded land and rebuilding its fertility as an investment. Um, now, of course, you're getting beyond what Ann and I know a whole lot about. Uh, people, people are building those funds. Don't worry. Yeah, they're, it's probably yeah. the most developed piece. Simple. I wouldn't say simply, but as, as real estate investments, you buy a rundown building that nobody sees value in you you make sure it, it gets fixed and hopefully super energy efficient and you rent it out and and people are doing that with land and we can have the discussion if land ownership uh, should even exist in that sense and, and should that be partly then funded by pension money etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's definitely uh it's definitely a way of of regenerating and and getting returns and and it's something that that has luckily been going on honestly and, and been been growing a lot because yeah there's a lot of land that's degraded and needs some some fixing let's say yeah yeah we could use a whole global program and reinvesting in in um in fixing degraded farmland we it could be a 50 year project and we still wouldn't be done yeah i mean it, it's a good question because um clearly <coughs> given the state of the land you know on this planet in agricultural areas it's you know, more is in bad shape than in good shape. And so that's, that's a big opportunity to turn that around. And what would be, you know, what would be really great, it's happening a bit here in the U.S. There's now um, various pieces of legislation that are focused on soil health. And, and the farm bill is coming up, right? This year. Yeah, and our farm bill is coming up. And so I think if we get sort of some government, um, there sort of has to be something driving. Uh, Do you think it's the consumer side of things? Could that be with like, let's say, the focus on soil health and the focus on your health and your kids' health, for instance, is way more important, I think, for many people than, or that's at least our hope, than soil health in general. Like, yeah, of course, the climate and water and, and uh, biodiversity, et cetera. But as soon as it touches you uh, and your family um, or the, 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 your loved yeah. ones, do you think that could be, I mean, this is of course speculation, but that could be a driver to get way more consumers or way more buyers interested in, in soil yeah. health? No, there's a, there's actually research on that here in the Puget Sound region. It, it was for a different thing. It was asking about lawn chemicals and what motivated people more than anything. It wasn't the environment. It wasn't water. It wasn't air. It was their kids and their pets. That is what was motivating changes in landscape practices that second part is a bit depressing but yeah no it's, it's actually I, I would say pet food is probably more pet food and cosmetics are more are more advanced in in terms of of practices etc than, than a lot of our food industry but yeah yeah i i guess what i would want investors to know about this you know and if there was a sort of an umbrella um push and that umbrella push is coming from consumers it's coming from companies it's being backstopped and bookended and assisted by actions of government then we're all on the same page around yeah this is what we want we want soil health because it plays a big role in human health then the pieces start to come into play where then people are like oh well now that we're we have i don't want to use the word you know standard but i would use language like um 
there's vast opportunity to improve soil health in a lot of places. And there's multiple ways to do that depending on what region you're in. And if we look at um, outcome-based measures rather than input. So I, I wouldn't want to, you know, I'd much rather talk about soil health scores and um, soil organic matter levels than, okay, no more synthetic fertilizer, no more this, no more that, because that's not, um, that hasn't, that's not always the best way to go because it doesn't allow a farmer to innovate given their soil, given their land, given their, their context, soil, yeah. given their knowledge. So I'm way into looking at outcome based and saying, okay, well, let's up the soil organic matter over a 10 year period by X percent. And, and you do that farmer how you know how you want to and and so i think um respecting multiple pathways and going with outcome based um measures in an environment where everybody is kind of pushing in this direction that would be pulling yeah yeah that that would be what i would like to see and then investment you know, can follow. It sort of answers my magic wand question. I always ask, what would you like to change? Which which it, which it answers. But then question on the investment side, let's say you're in charge of a, an investment fund of, I don't know, a billion euros or a billion dollars. What would you, with a very long time frame, if you need that, what would you, of course, not to the dollar, because uh, what would you prioritize? What would you focus on? Is it buying a lot of land? Is it focusing on processing? Is it focusing on measurement techni technology? Is it what would you, both of you could be very different, obviously. So let's start with Anne. What would you focus on if you could invest? So it had to come back at some point with uh, a fair return. What would you focus on from what you've seen now building food as medicine companies or what would you, what do you put your energy in? Boy. Um, I would like things to be, um, I would like things to be simpler for consumers somehow. I don't know how, I don't, I, I don't. I would like things to be simpler for consumers and more transparent for consumers so that they know that the products that they're getting are, you know, they say they are what they say they are. And I don't, you know, is there, a, can you invest in a truth squad or something like that, Cohen? <laughs> can we get a truth squad? Because I mean, there are some companies like How Good, et cetera, that are on the scoring side. So that could be, or you could set up or invest in companies that are. Um, yeah, extremely transparent and and connected to soil health, and so you would you could allocate part of that fund into food companies that are doing the right thing and are, let's say, quote unquote, explaining this complexity of soil to consumers, which I think is a very important role um, yeah. that that we haven't played well and we've been hiding about behind labels. So that I mean that could be could be technology investments, could be food invest food companies investments to drive, let's say, you would say demand. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I want. I want. I want a tree squad out there about how things work uh, in the soil and in agriculture, because I, I've always found that when people are equipped with knowledge and information, it's kind of like it's another form of body wisdom. Literally, um, we, you know, we equip a person with knowledge and information, and they start making decisions and choices and changing behaviors in ways that, you know support this common, you know, this common goal, at least that I think and hope that this community has, which is, you know, bettering the soil as a way of bettering planetary and, and human health. Yeah. So work and on so I think equip equip is an interesting word there because it's not enough that this knowledge is out there because a lot of this research has been out there for a while, some more recent, but many of these linkages have been there, pieces of the chain at least, and some cases decades, some cases more than a hundred years. And and somehow, yeah, we we've not been equipped, let's say, or at least a very very small yeah. uh, piece yeah. of piece of of uh, our, our population. What about you, David? What would you what would you do with a billion dollars if you had to invest it? I would recommend that they that I would hire Ann to run the Truth Squad. <laughs> <laughs> um, the but you know, in terms of opportunities that I. Um, there's sort of a the space that I think could be an interesting one. Uh, you know, anyone who trusts my investment advice is probably foolish, but I'll give it anyway. Um, it would be, you know, if we look at 
um, a resource that's really going to waste now that could be put into more productive use for building soil health, which I think is how we need to reorient thinking in, across this board in the agricultural sector. Um, you know, we waste about 30 to 40 percent of the food that comes into cities. It never gets eaten. Um, that's a resource that if we could figure out a way to direct that towards urban vegetable gardens, and I'm not talking about indoor hydroponic grows, I'm talking about sort of outdoor soil-based uh, vegetable gardens, for which there is space in cities if we got creative in thinking about it, um, that could help basically take advantage of that resource that's currently not very well utilized in cities and also connect people to healthier, fresher uh, food in areas of food islands and deserts. How great an investment opportunity that is, I don't know. But I well, see you've, that... you've pictured a very interesting farm in the book that has been doing financially very well, I mean, compared to many other places. So it, it's definitely, it seems to be like the market garden world, there yeah. seems to be space there. I'm not saying it's going to be crazy, but you, you can make money and, and okay yeah. money uh, with an okay effort. Yeah. Yeah, and what you could have would be a network of small farms. It seems like, you know, sort of the the market garden, urban, you know, urban or near urban um, uh, regenerative vegetable farms. You're talking acres, not tens or hundreds or thousands of acres. These could be small. The ones we visit were small family farms, literally, fa literally family operations. But they were very profitable. Um, and the key was healthy soil. And the key to them both was uh, compost and organic matter uh, 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 additions. Um, and that's what all that urban organic waste, uh, the food that we don't end up actually eating, could be repurposed towards. And, you know, you could imagine so whole municipal systems geared towards supporting small farms that are providing uh, family, stable family incomes and providing good, uh, fresh food to people. So, you know, in terms of what I'd love to see with that billion dollar investment portfolio, pick a city and try and actually establish a network like that. And, and demonstrate that it would be profitable, um, not only to the farmers, but also to the, the people who would be getting the produce and the, the sort of a, a looser definition of profitable and to the, the community in the cities uh, in terms of a better use of their compost, uh, urban organic waste as compost. And, and I think the key there is as well, higher quality compost are, are well made. I think there's, there's of yeah. course, a there are 50 shades of gray of compost and and yeah some can actually do harm if you do it wrong but and yeah. is there another this might be another rabbit hole but like is there interest do you find it interesting have you seen anything on the food we end up eating and all the waste that basically gets out of our houses places restaurants etc and and we don't end up using and we end up importing a lot of the the minerals and nutrients etc from other places to to recycle it is there is there any interest there like to close that loops basically from all the food we bring into the city part of it doesn't get eaten could be composted but part of it gets eaten and gets flushed down um is that did that come up at all is there any um, any interest there um there's you know i wrote a little bit in growing revolution about the city of tacoma that is uh composting uh the the human waste from their sewage treatment plant and they have a very sophisticated and very well-run system that involves, uh, you know, a year of compost. Um, but the um, and they're selling it back to urban gardeners that that produced what went into making the compost in the first place. Um, and they do very rigorous testing. There, there's a lot to worry because about. Because of course we have the medicines and and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, and if you what it seems to be from the literature is that the, if you compost it long enough and well enough, you can solve most of those problems. Of course, there's two really big exceptions: heavy metals can't compost those out, um, and also some of the so-called uh, forever chemicals, the PFAS and things. Um, and you know how the city of Tacoma dealt with heavy metals is they basically uh, worked with people the 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 industries that were putting the heavy metals into their waste stream and got them to do pre pre-treatment so it didn't get into the waste stream and why we're allowing those forever chemicals to actually be made in the first place is you know the right question to be asking because the, the upstream is the place to actually limit them yeah of course and what is next for you i mean you, you sort of seem to have come full circle literally with with this book in the trilogy and um, what are, I mean, apart from going on book tours and, and being on podcasts like this, etc. of course, the book is out now and, and trying to, to get the word out, selling the books, etc. What are, are you thinking about any future projects? 
are you what what could a future project where, where would you like to dive in deeper is it i don't know the oceans is it what 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 drives you for maybe next projects could take years obviously but well, we've, we've talked about the possible projects. One would be sort of looking more at the, the history of sort of plants and medicine and the way phytochemicals, the kind of things that we wrote about um, in What Your Food Ate, you know, how that has played out in terms of uh, the relationships between botany and medicine in the past. Um, and with the, what we're looking at in the current book is sort of the, the current version of that. Uh, I've flirted with the idea of trying to write sort of a short book that summarizes what we've done so far in the four books we've written around this area. But the the honest take is that we don't have any support to work on another book at the moment. And so right now we're focused on sort of breathing deeply, having gotten this one finished. I completely yeah. understand. Sorry, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to write about in this um, in this space once you get going on it. So uh, and like I said, we're curious people, so I'm sure you haven't heard the last from us. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Let's hope it doesn't take another four plus years uh, to, to have you back on. But I want to be conscious of your time as well. And, and thank you so much, first of all, for what you have done and are doing in this space and for writing this book, which I think is, is an absolute, um, I would say, page turner uh, for, for the geeks and the non-geeks, because if you're interested in how we potentially could get healthier and, and what it means for our planet. This is, uh, this is the one to, to get and I will recommend and gift it to as many as I can. So thank you so much for coming on again, uh, David, and for coming on for the first time and, and for the work you do and for sharing and coming on here to, to share about that. Well, thanks. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and thanks for the invitation. We'll look forward to doing it again. Yeah, thanks a lot, Cohen. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links discussed, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash post. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you liked this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.